Well, here we are again, folks. The end of another year of anime, plus the decade in general. We've seen the rise of the isekai, of modern shonen titles, and the substantial rise of why is this not a hentai? This year in particular meant so much to the community and has less to do with the quality of the shows, but the rate at which these shows are coming out. Anime has certainly been gaining momentum, especially this 2019, and despite so many, I had to find five anime that went further with their storytelling, characters, and especially animation. Like last year's list, only anime that have finished will be considered, which breaks my heart since Babylon should be on the list, but only has at this point just seven episodes out. It's a shame, but them's the rules. Without further ado, sharpen up your katanas and set that microphone up. It's time to see what the top five anime are in 2019. If people are going to remember 2019 for anything, it will be for two things. One is the abundance of isekai with stuff like Isekai Quartet, Shield Hero, and Cautious Hero, and the other is the amount of fresh new shonen titles we have. You got My Hero Academia of course, but then you have stuff like Dr. Stone and Demon Slayer, which broke trending boards all across the world after his 19th episode, and even made record-breaking sales because of Ufotable's excellent adaptation of the title. It was a pretty hard pick for number 5, but I concluded that despite how good Demon Slayer performed when it comes to action or story, I believe the best shown in adaptation this year has to go to the Orphans of Gracefields. <laughs> The Promised Neverland showed how vastly shonen archetypes have grown from the Naruto Bleach days of old. Instead of being high stakes action or even bloody martial arts, this takes an intellectual approach of a creepy science fiction thriller where a trio of smart orphans must escape the grounds of a human farm that feeds the young to demons beyond the wall. Each episode is always intriguing to watch, and that has to come with the main strength of the show's atmosphere. The shots, for example, are composed in a manner that binds the viewer into a scenario where you are always being watched, causing this overwhelming claustrophobia that can most likely catch you off guard and it did for me on one or two occasions. While the characters aren't the most interesting in the first few episodes, we do have this empathy for them to achieve their goal of getting away from the adults. Especially the head mother of the farm, Isabella, who might be one of the best anime villains of 2019, and that comes down to just the creep factor of her always being collective and brutal in her execution. The other positives of Promise Neverland is also the sound design, the off-on-guard animation style that can bring chills and dread when the scene suits it, and the story near the end leaves off in a way that truly caps everything it's set up. The mysteries will most likely be explored in more seasons, but the essential plot lines are wrapped up nicely without having to adhere to the standard to be continued that a lot of shonen anime have. I could watch this as a standalone season and be completely satisfied, and while some might see this as part one of a continuing tale, I see it as a show with a beginning, middle, and end that just so happens to continue on. Some say it might not quite capture the unique style of the manga, but I think the majority of it did pretty good in the end. The Promised Neverland did something different from the rest of the shonen shows, and while Demon Slayer made real steps in the animation department in its adaptation, the fact of the matter is that I feel more satisfied with the overall show of Neverland than just one standout moment of Demon Slayer. Decide for yourself, but for me. If there is one series that had the best concept and most excitement this year, consider Promise Neverland as one of those shows. For the next entry, it's time to tackle the decade-defining debate of computer animation in anime. Stiff, lifeless, and sometimes too polished, CGI is what many anime shows have been getting into, but have not implemented it in the best of ways. But people do forget that Studio Orange has pushed the boundaries of computer-generated effects in anime to a new high standard with Land of the Lustrious. But wait, that didn't come out in 2019. And you're right, it's their new show that came out, and one that I believe has made advancements in the art form to new levels, despite its furry palette. Beastars was already an award-winning manga about a Zootopia-like society coming to grips with their predatory instincts, so the hardest part was trying to completely design that same world in a 3D environment, and for the most part, it exceeded in its direction, layout, and animation that the CGI is actually very appealing for once. 
Instead of going for the crystallized look of their last show, it's now inhabited with furs, feathers, and scales that bring these anthropomorphic models to life. They don't feel lifeless or stiff like with other 3D anime, and instead have a personality and charm to make them feel more real. It knows its limits and it doesn't feel like a hindrance to the quality of the show at all. The characters are lovingly written and the storyline is both gripping and tantalizing to the viewer watching. Like when the characters are on stage or going through silo problems like isolation or unrequited love. The world these animals live in is fascinating to see unravel before us and every citizen small and large is given so much background and detail to help cement its environment. Plus it takes a couple of very good artistic liberties such as with the open the show done in stop motion, some really great intercutted 2D animation, and even shadow puppetry for the added dark factor. Studio Orange has really nailed this 3D technology, and instead of it being detrimental to the world building, it really helps enshrine the idea of a utopia full of real world problems and hypocrisies. Now the only problem with the show is its availability to the public since Netflix has been keeping it in a cage until next year, which sadly is a bit of a mixed bag and has forced a few of us to have to watch it illegally because of it. I would want to recommend waiting for its North American release, but I'm not enforcing that statement because if Netflix really wants to get into the anime streaming game, they'll have to make some compromises, I'm just saying. But for what it is, Beastars is just one more gold medal to add to Studio Orange's cabinets, and one I hope you guys check out. Just be aware, there'll be some, uh titillating scenes in here that will probably make you uncomfortable to watch, so watch your step before entering this show. The next show to make the list is one with the most engaging and provocative story out of all the anime this year. Epics of size and scope that get people engaged in its worlds and characters' dilemmas. Shows like Dororo or Blade of the Immortal are ones that show the scale of warfare, despite heavily being in the realm of fantasy. But to get a true feeling of a harsh world full of consequences, revenge, and savagery, just let the Vikings do what they do best. I can't find a lot that hasn't been said about how truly great Vinland Saga is, and it's pretty hard to find problems or admittance in this adaptation of one of the best manga stories of all time. People like to call this berserk but with Vikings, and unlike Guts whose own anime works are, let's say amusing at best, this one makes up for it in spades with a little bit of CGI, but it's not too bad, I guess. I think what makes this show truly one of a kind is not really the action or the main revenge story that main hero Thorfinn is on, but it's all about the dialogue, the scheming, spearheaded by some of the best characters of the year. Torkel is brutishly fun, Knut is a pleasure to see grow, and to say no less of my favorite character Ashlod is doing his contribution to my enjoyment of Vinland very poorly. Hands down, one of my favorite anime characters ever, and easily the one to steal the show in almost every appearance he's in, and that role should go to the main character. He is such a bastard of a man, but he wins you over quite quickly, thanks to his charisma and bravado. I can say more, but let's move on. Otherwise, this video is just gonna be a Ashlot suck fest. The world is rich and fertile, and the animation can look grand and savage in one shot, but then oddly warm and comforting in another. The background especially is some of the best artwork I've seen in any action show. But give it credit, when the action gets swinging and the heads start flying off, it's wonderful. Makes sense for a studio that redefined how you do action scenes after their accomplishments with Attack on Titan. In Vinland Saga, there are no good guys, and the entire moral of the story is how violence and pillaging Vikings do is secretly chaining them to fates that aren't worth fighting towards. It's a show about slavery, vengeance, and liberation, where we follow characters who might be fun and quirky while on a boat, but will then murder, rape, and burn anything in their sight. We want to see our main character to leave this world and be free from it, but the more people get in his way, the more he steps closer to the edge of a cliff. I may be embellishing the brilliant writing and story just a little bit, but it is really good. I mean, berserk levels of good. It's an epic anime tale that doesn't sacrifice the core themes as narrative or bloody action, and here's hoping it gets a second season to continue it. So go ahead and give this Viking show a try, folks, because this is one that I couldn't let go of, even if I wanted to. Okay, cooling our jets now, let's go to high school again and get a few laughs from all the...
maiming and murdering we just saw. High school comedies are as abundant as ever this year, but only a few genuinely made me gut laugh the most. All Maidens of Our Savage Season was uniquely funny in that it was a mature comedic take on adolescent puberty, despite a rushed ending. Orosuki was a surprisingly refurbished harem comedy that was sarcastically joyful. And even that Dumbbell Show was a funny edutainment style comedy show that was pretty beneficial for your health. But I think the crown queen of comedy this year can only be worn by the great one herself, Chika. Or the show she comes from, Kaguya-sama Love is War. Stupidly simple, could have gone south real quickly if left in less talented hands. This anime shouldn't work, but it does. It does work so well. The plot about two high school student council members at a privileged school trying to make the other confess is about as vanilla and motivation it can be, but what makes the show click comes down to comedic timing, variety and confrontation, and its wonderful cast of smart yet naive characters. Kaguya is adorably sweet and mischievous, while Shiragane is hardworking but lacking in everything else but academics. Just ask Chika, who is uh, secretly everyone's favorite meme in the show, go fucking figure. The driving force of the comedy in the show, the two lovers, are almost always concocting plans to get the other to confess first, as it would mean they would reign dominance over the other. Basically, who is the bottom bitch in the relationship? And since they're mostly clueless about romance due to their high status and lack of relationship knowledge while studying in a school system full of narcissists and rich kids, makes the comedy five times as hilarious. I love it when a show can just make the most of their one-note jokes and turn them into laugh riots that only get bigger, better, and even more adventurous in their bits. From movie tickets to Twitter, volleyball to mock exams, and even rivalry bouts with the French, this high school rom-com knows how to write a material. But if I was just laughing my ass off, I wouldn't be as invested in the romance parts that are... Yeah, very effective. I like these characters being awkward to one another, and when they let down their egos for just a second to enjoy the moment. There are even episodes where I even get a bit emotional about their life outside school. Yes, I really did feel for them. I've been realizing that with comedy shows, you need character and heart to make those moments really shine, and Kaguya-sama really does. I, like many, were completely caught off guard by its lovable cast and laugh out loud jokes in the same vein as Konosuba or School Rumble. And while it's not a show that goes too far in its humor, it just means they are confident in their ability to make something fun and relaxing. So if you're in the mood for a comedy that, while not as risky or adult like other shows, can still land its jokes well, this is definitely a show for the awkward romantic in you. Now for first place, I had to give it to an anime that went above and beyond to deliver the best moments of this year, and 2019 was certainly a great year for sequel shows. Attack on Titan Part 3, Don Machi Season 2, and even Simpho Gear were ones that redefined their status in the anime fans' hearts for embracing their concepts and running gold with them. However, while I did enjoy most of these sequel shows, I always thought that they were merely just doing things slightly above their normal standards. And when I do lists like these, I want to have an anime that completely blows me out of the water in their second or third core run. Well, that did happen this year, and some of you might have already guessed it. It's an anime that didn't just go 100% in its delivery, it went over that very set number into the great unknown and back. Mob Psycho 100 Season 2 was a goddamn leap in quality from the first season, and that season was already impressive enough as it was. But with this second season, it doubled down on what made the first season awesome and added even more on top. Its animation, excellent. Stories, excellent. Characters, excellent. Every big moment, funny moment, quiet moment, and silly moment is magnified beyond the levels of your typical anime production, and that can only be how the director and animators really went outside limits to trigger some of the best sequences of 2019. This season took our characters and writes them into fresh and new plot lines that reaffirms why we love them in the first place. Mob learns more about controlling his emotions and finding more enjoyment out of getting something his own way without his psychic powers. Reagan has to be put into his lowest point in his career in order to know what truly matters in life. From the first episode to the last, every character significantly has a change in their motivation and their desire. Villains and other supporters come back in better ways, learning from their mistakes and finding what they need to be happy. 
It's this power of change that is a hallmark of Mob Psycho that is further explored upon in this season, and it's just a marvel. It felt like more of the same, but with a hundred times the momentum and generosity when compared to the last one. The payoffs are executed well, and the variety in which the show dabbles in, like urban legends, fraudulent psychics, and even finding love are fantastically paced and wonderfully put together. And did I mention the animation and the shots and the lighting effects? I mean, oh my god! I don't know what else to say other than this show shook me to my core. There is a reason so many love Mob Psycho 100, and this one is just the first season but with more heart, more action, more development, and especially more mob. It is gonna be hard to top this one as the best anime of. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and if you like my content, please subscribe to my channel. It's your bra man saying farewell to 2019.